It's been said we're going to wake up one day and ask ourselves, what America are we living in? And that is a big question that we're going to be talking about today with Senator Josh Kimbrell, Republican Senator out of Spartanburg County. I'm Dave Wilson, along with Justin Hall. Senator Kimbrell, thanks so much for being here We're here today. cozy, all cozy. We're all cozy nice here on camera. Glad to be here in the studio today. Senator, we, we are setting up right now a real discussion about some things that are going on when it comes to the way that the financial institutions in the world are beginning to look at what we as conservatives believe and using that as an opportunity to, for lack of a better phrase, begin to, to make strikes against us when it comes to our ability to borrow money, work in our businesses because of something called ESG scores. Can you uh, give us some inf insight on that from your years in finance? Well, being one of the few senators that's a former banker, I, I probably have more uh, understanding of the banking system than most. I don't mean that in a personally braggart, kind of braggadocio kind of way, but I've spent more time with it than most. It is very disturbing what's happening with particularly the larger banks. The smaller banks aren't as big of a deal here in the, yet. What we're witnessing in the United States right now is a consolidation of all things big. It's an authoritarianistic model. And, you know, it's, we're not China. We're not a communist society or anything like that. But what we have is an American authoritarianism. It's an alliance between big government and big business, and that certainly includes big banks. And that needs to be actually concern everybody because I'm not against a big business, but I am against a big business that's in bed with big government. And that's what we're increasingly seeing. And ESG scores is the most recent tool they've decided to adopt. And, and that stands for Economic Social Governance Score. And it, it's really, this goes back to 2008. You got to go back to the, you keep hearing this phrase now, the Great Reset. The Great Reset began in like 2008 because this was after the financial crisis this is after the upheaval of the, the mortgage-backed securities all failing because the government decided they were going to buy all these mortgages and things of that nature. And banks got bailed out to the tune of billions of dollars, billions of dollars. Now, the Bush administration did not, they didn't do the ESG scores in, in 2008. When the Obama administration came in, they started pushing these banks, okay, we're going to bail you out, but we want you to do this and this and this. And so they became woke, so to speak. It's the wokeism idea that if you promote enough uh, uh, of the agenda regarding climate change or, or LGBT, uh, particularly with regards to sexual orientation and identity, all these things that somehow it was like paying social penance for getting bailed out to the tune of billions of taxpayer dollars. And the newest manifestation of this wokeism is ESG scores, which is where big businesses and big banks are deciding to rate one another and investors and potential credit uh, clients based on how woke they are. So it's, it's almost like a credit score, but it's your social credit score, which the only country in the world that really does that right now is China. So I find that whenever we start doing things like China does it, that's not good. I don't like emulating China that much uh, because I do. they are a communistic authoritarian regime. And what this is going to rate you on, what the ESG score is, if you've supported enough carbon offset tax credits, for example, then you'll get a, that's a mark in your favor. If you've ever invested in Exxon Mobil, uh, it's probably Mark against you. If you believe in drill, baby, drill, as I happen to, I don't have a pin on, but I wear one right now with $5 gas, then that's a mark against you. But if you support putting more, if you support John Kerry and putting more greenhouse, you know, greenhouses up or the solar panels up, then you get a check for that. If you support the idea of 36 genders, you get a good ESG score. If you believe in male and female, then they're going to dock you. So essentially it's wokeism in a, in a score form. And it's very disturbing that some businesses are now deciding on with which businesses they're going to do business with, and certain government agencies are trying to decide where they're going to let contracts go based on an ESG score. And we, there's certainly a push to move that toward individual credit scores also, which could mean that when you go to apply for a home mortgage at some point, or if you're a business and you apply for a business line of credit, it's not just whether you have an 800 credit score and you can pay the payment, it's do you believe enough of the woke stuff that the big banks do? So there's a place that in some research that's been done that says a new framework for evaluating businesses, that's the kind of basis for ESGs. And so instead of looking at a profit or loss or debt or employee satisfaction, other standard business metrics, they're looking at where you stand on other issues, environment, social justice, governance, do you have the right balance of the number of types of employees in your business? From a banker's standpoint, how do you look at that and, and see that as any level of relevance as to whether or not you're going to be lending money to somebody? Well, I never made any decisions based on that as a, as a banker, and most banks don't. To your point, they're still going to use those other metrics. Okay, so let's don't, let's don't 
make it seem as if they're going to pull all that out. They're still going to, a bank is still going to say, okay, can they make the payment, right? They want to get paid. They're still going to look at those things. But if all things are held equal, let's say that you have a business and I have a business and both of our businesses are strongly cash flow positive and both are making good earnings and the balance sheets look good and all the traditional bank metrics are fine. But yet your business has supported, uh, you invested in companies like Hobby Lobby or you like really to cater from Chick-fil-A or you happen to, you know, be pretty open about the fact you go to a Baptist church or you happen to be president of Palmetto Family Council, those are all going to work against you. And let's say, now this is hard for me to even say because I would never do these things, but let's say I was a member of like Greenpeace and I donated to groups that don't like the police and I bought a lot of carbon tax credits from Al Gore's friends, then I would get a loan and you might not. Not because you're not credit worthy in a traditional sense, but because we're both credit worthy in that regard. But then they're going to say, okay, but this guy is a bigot by their definition, and this guy's not, and that's how they're going to do it. I think that's that's starting to happen. I mean, it's not theoretical. It's starting to happen. Senator, people are hearing this. We had a conversation on Tuesday about ESG scores, and we really went into the Great Reset and what that looks like. And, and I made the comment, Mitch and I both did, that when something gets reset, it has to be broken first. Something has to break in order to reset it in the most ideal sense. Obviously, you mentioned 2007, 2008 with, with banking. We look at what happened uh, in 2020 with COVID-19 and sure. basically the artificial shutting down of the economy, which now if you have to drum it back up, let's drum it back up the way we want to. How, for South Carolinians who, by and large, South Carolina has done well throughout the pandemic and, and has done a lot better than other states in terms right. of keeping businesses open sure. and keeping things available to their citizens. What would you say to the folks who are watching this right now who say, well, that's a that's a California problem, that's a Canada problem, that's a China problem, I don't need to worry about it in South Carolina? Well, it is true that we've man managed to ride the storm better than others, and you're right that the COVID pandemic was certainly a catalyst for a lot of the changes. I mean, look at what Joe Biden ran on a campaign platform of Build Back Better, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's essentially saying, well, you know, this we we melted it down through shutting stuff down, and now we're going to build it the way we want. I, I remember a cartoon that I saw during the uh, coronavirus shutdowns, all these mandates being put in places. And if you recall, you had even in our state to some degree, and the governor master was far less heavy-handed than the vast majority. But we've taken actions even in the Senate to restrict the power of governors in the future to do these rolling executive mm -hmm. orders because of our concern. But look at other states that. Uh, Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan or Gavin Newsom of California or the governor of New York, both, both, both Cuomo and now the new lady, saw a cartoon that illustrated it well. It showed a, a, a kid, it's like a, play, a playground brawl, and there's a kid laying on the ground on his back getting his nose bloodied, and then there's another person over there like clapping, and the, it, it says the guy on the ground is labeled small business. The person punching the guy on the ground in the face is labeled shutdown governors. And the person clapping in the corner was Walmart, Amazon, and all the big box stores. Because that's what we did, right? I and mean, let's be honest, that's what we did. Yeah. The, 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 it was considered essential to go to Walmart. It was not essential to go get your hair cut. It was considered essential to go to Costco, but not to go to the street, uh, to, the, to the little store on the corner of the street. That's insane. Yeah. And, and that's an agenda, right? Because it's not, it's, apparently the coronavirus is the smartest virus in the history of the world because it could get you... The small corner barbershop, but it won't get you at Walmart. It'll take you out when you go to eat at Chick Fil A, but it won't get you at Costco. Crazy, but they, they use the crisis to push an agenda, and it's easier to control big businesses. And these big businesses are suckling at the power teeth. There's no other way to put it. They're trying to get contracts from the government, blessings from the government, and, uh, and towing the liberal line. And and that's where we have to put a stop to this. South Carolina did not engage in that, uh, but. If, these, if larger banks do this and we don't stop it, we have to be proactive. So to your question, why should South Carolinians care? Because we haven't outlawed it. And I have written letters to the Secretary of Commerce and to the, uh, to the Treasurer as the head of the Board of Financial Institutions, and I have said I don't want any targeted tax incentives to any business here based on any form of ESG score. I want to prohibit any bank who's licensed in this state from using an ESG score as a consideration for credit. And I am moving... It'll probably be next year because we're so late in the session this year. We're going to put together an entire comprehensive piece of legislation to outlaw all of this. Uh, I, I will not allow any – so as much as it is up to me, I will not allow a single business in this state to operate on a prejudicial, bigoted basis of shutting down people of faith. Because it's ironic to me, these ESG advocates and all these folks, oh, it's about diversity and inclusion. It's about tolerance. No, it isn't. 
It's about forced conformity. It's about making people do what they want. And we're not doing that here. When you begin to look at how this impacts individual rights, I want to read a piece right here. It talked about the fact that Merrill Lynch, which is a division of Bank of America, sure. uh, gave Facebook a relatively low ESG score in part because Facebook was not doing enough to stifle certain kinds of speech on its platform. Right. Now, this is a place of the public-private partnership that exists between woke corporations and a government that cannot shut down your rights of free speech. And yet, that's exactly what we have seen groups like Facebook and others doing. Yeah, you know, it's ironic to me that Merrill Lynch would give Facebook a low ESG score, given that Facebook and Twitter banned former President Donald Trump, but Vladimir Putin still has an account. Uh, that ought to tell you about all you need to know about particularly Twitter. That Twitter is, a, I, love, I love the hypocrisy. Well, we believe in free speech. No, you don't. You believe in free speech uh, for dictators and communists, but you don't believe in free speech in America. Uh, that, that's Look, ironically, Merrill Lynch has given them a bad score. I actually have a bill back up in subcommittee again next week to go after social media companies. So uh, I felt like one of the greatest accomplishments of my adult life is I made Twitter and Facebook hire lawyers in South Carolina. Normally, I'm not trying to send business to lawyers, but I did make them hire lawyers here. When we move into, in, in, into what can be done here, we're at the second half of the legislative session we're halfway through the second half of the, of the legislative session, and we're going to be looking at what can be done in the time frame that's left. There's, the clock is beginning to run out for this session. Yeah. True. But there are moves that can be made, things that could be done within the state budget. The House just passed budget this week. It's going to be coming over, made it to the Senate yesterday. The senator, your colleagues are going to be working through the Senate budget and, and your version of it and making some changes. Is this something that could be injected into, at least in proviso language? Oh, yeah. I intend, some, well, look, I intend to add provisos in the budget for commerce. I intend to add uh, provisos in the budget for the Board of Financial Institutions, Treasurer, everybody regarding ESG scores. Uh, they're going to get sick of seeing the phrase ESG because I'm going to use it in every department that can touch it. If it's the Board of Financial Advisors, if it's commerce, if it's uh, any, any development or economic entity, we're going to put the screws to them on ESG. Because, you know, I was at a, a meeting a few weeks ago of the, of the Council of Economic Developers in South Carolina, right? So you got a lot of county developers, county officers. And I'm in this meeting, and I noticed that uh, a couple of them were talking about ESG scores. And I walked over, and I started a conversation with one of the guys, nameless, but down in the low country. I said, I, I think this is a terrible idea. He said, oh, we have to do it. If we don't do it, we'll never compete economically again. So that's where, that's where we're going to go, right? We're going to get the same thing we always We get this hysterical uh, over overreaction, exaggeration, well, we'll be out of business, we'll never create another job. Give me a break. We, you and I both know that Walmart's not going to shut down their stores in South Carolina because we don't do ESG scores. They may pontificate and bloviate. They're not going to shut down stores for 5.2 million people. Costco's not going to suddenly bulldoze their, their store at Westgate in Spartanburg. You're not going to have Amazon go torch their own warehouses in Lexington. Uh, and, and here's the deal. If they want to do that, fine. I mean, if they're stupid enough to do that, then that's pretty, that's pretty remarkable. They're not going to do that. It's, it's a bluff. If you don't want to do business in South Carolina, we're not woke enough, fine by me. I don't want to be woke. Uh, we'll take the businesses here that don't want to play that game. I mean, there's plenty of them. I mean, there are plenty of businesses that do, that do their job and don't play this crazy game. And it, those are the ones you want here. We'll welcome everybody to South Carolina, but not if you're going to trample the conscience rights of our citizens. So as you are at home or you're watching this on Facebook or you're listening to it on a podcast, understand we're going to be using this as an opportunity for you to know what's going on so that you're familiar with this issue. You understand from a biblical standpoint exactly what's happening with this, but also what actions are being taken in our state legislature to put a, a hedge of protection around South Carolina and the way that this state does business, especially for business and individuals. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm deeply worried about the, the trend. There's it, this, the notion that money, former Governor Sanford, before he went hiking, uh, used to use the expression all the time, and I liked the governor's policies a lot of times. Personally, it was a little interesting, but um, he, said, he used to use the phrase that Money is a proxy for freedom. That's true. I mean, we, we even, this South Carolina Bible, the South Carolina Prayer Breakfast this morning, the speaker even mentioned that, uh, and he's right, that Jesus references money that more than just about any other topic. 
And it's not because I think he was obsessed with getting a stock portfolio return or anything. I don't think right. Jesus was invested in the Roman stock market. But the point is, is he knew and knows that people value, that money is a, is a medium of exchange, right? And everybody needs it to live. And so whenever governmental entities or large corporations in bed with governmental entities want to control your access to capital, or control your access to the banking system, control your access to the marketplace, that is a proxy for freedom. And we are witnessing, again, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning, this unholy alliance between big business and big government to force conformity of thought. And that's truly un-American. Uh, we've never had companies in the United States. You just think about in our lifetimes. In our lifetimes, we've never had companies do this until recently. Most of the time, larger companies were just doing their thing, and the government and the companies did all they could not to interact with each other. And now it's like you've got big government entities, particularly on the left, and big business interests that are like one and the same. And th th these large corporations are almost an extension of, of the government. And that is terrifying to me because that if you have large banks that control billions and billions of dollars of capital, and they deny access to anybody that disagrees with the governing liberal elites line, that really freezes out millions of Americans who have a conservative bent from the marketplace. So you're now saying it, it's almost like, and I'm not trying to sound hysterical when I say this, but you, you know, you read in the scriptures about in, in the tribulation period later in, in time, gosh, sometimes I wonder if we might not be close to that. Uh, there's this kiss the ring, so to speak, to participate in the global economy. Well, this is a lot like that. It is a precursor to it at the least. And, and right. Justin, I think as, as we begin to look through this and, and we recognize, as we've talked about before on this podcast, there are, there are signs, there are indications that there are major moves underway. And folks at home, folks listening in your car, you've got to be familiar with these things because it's something that you could very easily gloss over because, oh, I heard somebody say this, but I haven't, don't have a clue about what it means. Right. It, is, it is an undertow uh, type of pull that's happening, that if it happens in certain areas and begins to take hold, you're going to lose some essential freedoms that we have recognized and know that we have as Americans. Well, Senator Kimbrell mentioned it, that this really got started in around 2008. It's 2022, and we're talking about it more and more now than we were in 2008. People, it, it takes a while for folks to understand what's going on because many people, we just don't keep our ear to the ground on some things and some things we like to pass off as well. That's, that's a bit of a conspiracy theory. That's a little tinfoil hat. And if I talk about it, I'm a weirdo. And in this case, I think these are things that you mentioned actually threaten freedom. They yeah, actually yeah, threaten and I freedom. Yeah, and I think there's a difference. And just a good point. There's a difference between being a tinfoil hat wearer. I don't usually wear any tinfoil. Right. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I've never mm -hmm. been that guy. I'm not, like, I'll, I'll give you what I used to call, and I did radio, my standard loon test. If you uh, believe that George W. Bush uh, perpetrated the attacks of 9-11, you're crazy. If you believe that the moon landing happened in a studio in Arizona, you're crazy. Um, these are, those are nutcase ideas, okay? That's crazy. This isn't conspiracy here. I mean, look, do I think that there's a secret cabal at the White House, you know, uh, puppeting Joe Biden to force people into concentration camps? No, I mean, that's, that's nuts. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a soft authoritarianism. It's mm -hmm. not a communist ideology. We're not a communist country. Right. This isn't even socialism. It's crony corporatism. There's a difference. It is a, it's an alliance between big businesses and big, uh, corp big corporations and big government to push the woke agenda. It's not socialism. They're not talking about taking your house. They're just going to make it harder for you to buy a bigger house because it's gonna, you're going to have a lot harder dealing with bigger companies. It's a soft authoritarianism, but it's sure. still anti-American, and we have to be mindful that it pushes an agenda that is not in keeping with the Judeo-Christian heritage of the nation, is not in keeping with the notion of individual rights or, or the freedom of business and, and commerce. And in that sense, it is a significant threat, but there's still plenty of time, in my view, to reverse that. Little by little, it was mentioned at the prayer breakfast as well at one point, that little by little you'll lose your freedom, and then one day you'll wake up and you'll go, oh, I'm not free anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and things like this are more, are more than anything restricting and clamping down more and more. I love the Facebook conversation that happened earlier because if we're talking about Facebook not being good at stopping certain kinds of speech, I mean, I can say the word uh, COVID in a post and not even be about COVID and I will get a little, 
you know, well, learn and I more would, here. I would say we'll use some great words of wisdom from Monty Python. Okay, <laughs> if you remember that one scene where where they're all standing out there chanting, "We are individuals. We are individuals. We are individuals." Well, obviously that's an oxymoron, right? I mean, if you got a thousand people chanting, "We are individuals" from the same sheet of music, they're not individuals. And, right. and that's what the woke, woke Inc. wants us to be, is, is a collective. They want us, everybody, to force conformity of thought. And it, it, the irony of all of it, it, and it's truly the marketing of evil, it's, it's the, the irony of it is this stuff is pitched to us, is this is about diversity, this is about inclusion, this is about equal opportunity, but it is about all of the opposite things. It's not about diversity of thought. It's not about including people they don't, that the woke, woke Inc. doesn't agree with. It is uh, not about making sure there's equal opportunity for all. It's equal opportunity if you agree with the governing political elite. Right, yeah. uh, that, is, uh, th that is completely uh, dishonest and to market it that way. Yeah, unity has been preached, but unity only when, you, when I club you over the head. And unity you when you agree with me. Unity right. when you agree with me. That's the main thing. There are going to be some places where we're going to dive deeper into this particular issue. We're going to look at how to help you recognize how ESG scores and how this whole movement is going to start impacting your life and where you start recognizing it happening within your own community. That'll be more of what we talk about here on Palmetto Family Matters podcast and other publications that we put out. So Senator Josh Kimbrell, uh, the, the leading uh, Republican senator out of Spartanburg right now, you have done a lot of great work in this in this first year in office and your first well, second year in office well second year in office first term uh, of really having impact on what's going on in the discussions uh probably unlike any other freshman senator in in the history of this state and that's that's a i think your years of experience of what you've been doing on the radio before you came on here and and just your understanding of issues has really been impactful in what's going on in the senate well i appreciate those kind words look i mean for me it's just you've got a limited time to do things and I've always been, let's go do it now. I, I don't believe in forcing people. I mean, I don't try to drag everybody along with me, but I do try to like fire things up a little bit. Right. Because I think things are moving fast in our culture, that things are moving mm -hmm. fast in the country, and we've got to be quick to respond to it. It can't be, this isn't 1998 anymore. Uh, this isn't even 2005 anymore. Stuff that we thought was unthinkable 10, 15 years ago is happening at a re really rapid clip. And if we're not adept to respond to that, we're going to wake up one day thinking, what in the world happened, and why don't we recognize the country? I think we're getting there now. We'll talk more about this and dive deeper into ESGs and other issues along these lines on future issues and editions of Palmetto Family Matters Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today for Justin Hall and Senator Josh Kimblon, Dave Wilson. Have a great day.